Hi, Martin. How are you doing today? Hey, hey, Daniel. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. It's afternoon here. It's there. It's oh, this time zone stuff always confuses the hell out of me. So anyway, man, yeah. thanks for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. How's your morning treating you? My morning is good. I'm glad you gave me a bit of a sleep in because I had quite a long day yesterday. So it's about 11 a.m. Right. here in in Australia, and um, usually I'm up quite early to coach, uh, but today's my day off. So. That's pretty good. You work as a coach at JPS too, besides your 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 research work. Yes, yes, yeah. Yesterday was quite a big day. I took twenty personal training sessions across the day, so that that was ten hours of of coaching. So half an hour sessions, twenty sessions, and that's why I needed to sleep in. Oh man, don't worry. I, I'm really honored to have you and to get to talk to you about your your research in this area. In, awesome. in, in regards to failure training, I was just checking your, well, the whole week I've been checking your, your episode on iron culture. So just okay. to, to, to have a little bit of a structure, I'd like to begin talking about your, not your main your made analysis, but your scoping review, because I know you've been interested in, in researching in proximity failure, not in, your, in that particular meta, but also beforehand, right? Correct. So the overarching topic of my PhD is muscle hypertrophy. But specifically, I'm interested in how proximity to failure may influence muscle hypertrophy. And more practically, I'm interested in how proximity to failure interacts with a whole host of other variables that then go on to influence muscle hypertrophy. Because in practice, the adaptations that we experience, they are never coming from the application of just one variable, but rather the integration of many variables like volume, load, proximity to failure, etc. Um and the scoping review, which you're alluding to, that was the basis for the recent meta-analysis that was published. And that was my opportunity to scope the available literature, look at the current limitations, look at the current research gaps, look at what we currently know, and then put forth uh, some suggestions for future research to, to use and to apply so that we can one day hopefully have a much better understanding as to how all of this works and a much better understanding as to how proximity to failure influences hypertrophy. So, yeah, the scoping review was the basis and the meta-analysis was our chance to statistically analyse some of the studies from that scoping review. And that's really interesting, like you mentioned, because there's this interaction between all these training variables and whether we train to failure or not. It's not like a dichotomy, right? It's training to failure, you're, you're one of the pros, you don't know what you're doing. Not training to failure, oh, then you're an inform lifter. We need to see what definition of failure we're operating with, the volume, mm -hmm. the, the experience of the lifter. And I, I'd like to begin just by that, by the definition of failure. What have, been your, what have you found in the literature? What are the gaps, what are the, the challenges? What is failure? like you started? Yeah. So one of the key limitations of the current research, which a lot of people do seem to speak about, is that there seems to be no consensus definition for failure. And sometimes participants in research studies don't actually train to true, true failure. So that is a fair critique of the current research. And that was something I was able to look into and to write about in that scoping review. And what I found was like what most people expect, you know, there are various definitions of failure that researchers apply in their studies, some more objective than others. So, for example, uh, the definition that we can apply to what is known as momentary muscular failure seems to be the most objective definition of failure and it's what people like on the gym floor i think usually allude to when they use the term failure so they're alluding to an objective and involuntary set termination point and the way i define this in the scoping view and uh, some researchers do apply this definition which is good uh, it's the point in a set where despite attempting to do so an individual is unable to complete the concentric portion of their rep with a full range of motion so Based on that definition, you can imagine how 
that point of failure needs to be observed within a set. So it's not a matter of finishing a repetition and then saying that you've reached failure. It's a matter of continuing to perform repetitions until you actually get to that point. And some studies do apply that definition of failure, which is great. And I like to give more stock or put more stock into those studies because I think that is a definition of failure that we are all interested in and that allows participants within a given group to actually achieve a standardized stimulus uh, upon terminating their sets. Because you could imagine, Daniel, if I was to have a group of participants and I all told them, and I told them all, sorry, to train to volitional failure, right, the point where you terminate a set on your own accord when you think you've reached failure, you can imagine how the stimulus achieved upon set, set termination would, would be different across a group of participants. But if I tell everyone to reach the point of momentary muscular failure, well, the stimulus is going to be more standardized and as such, we're going to have more reliable and valid results. So the cool thing about the scoping review and the subsequent meta-analysis was that I was able to group studies into specific themes or categories based on the definition of set failure that the researchers applied and the research question being asked. And this approach was absent in previous research. Uh, previous research has simply lumped all these studies together independent of the definition of failure. And based on what I'm saying, you could understand how that may be a confounding factor to the results that we're seeing. And we do have to pay respect to the definition of, definition of failure when we're interpreting studies. So hopefully that makes uh, sense. And hopefully by now you can understand how important it is to actually account for the definition of, of failure when analyzing these studies. Yeah, totally, because that's a common critique in several studies that I've seen over the years. I can think of the one study by Schoenfeld, which was a replication of a Radielli study, where the subjects were doing something like 45 sets of squats to failure, and some people came to say, how can you train 40 plus sets to failure? One, what is the definition of failure to you guys? It's, it's mm -hmm. crazy, right? So the way that mm -hmm. you're... you're, you're well, the definition of true momentary muscle failure, it's kind of... The, the thing that, um, that confuses me a little bit, to, to put it better, I was just rephrasing in my mind, the, the, the difference between an RAR zero, thinking of momentary muscle failure and volitional failure. For example, if I go through, maybe I completed 10 reps, but if I know that I can try another rep, I will fail. So would that morning be an R, R zero or one, or maybe minus one? Mm, when will, that's what, a really good, yeah, that's a really good one. point. Go to, to negative numbers because that in practice, I think it can be a, a really interesting consideration. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. I, th I think there is a difference between what one may call a zero RIR and what is truly momentary muscular failure. So this, this uh, idea of zero R RIR and momentary muscular failure, these ideas, they do need to be teased apart, I think, in research. And that's why the, the definition of momentary muscular failure is important. I think, like you said, Daniel, um, you could reach it, what you think is a zero RIR on the gym floor, but you're not actually going to know if the next repetition would be momentary muscular failure unless you attempted it. So, in research, we, we need to tease those two apart, and some studies do that better than others. In some studies, it's actually unclear whether the researchers are referring to momentary muscular failure or if they're using the term failure to refer to a zero RIR. Uh, sometimes those ideas are actually conflated. Uh, and on, on, the, on the gym floor, in practice, we have to think about failure, I guess, more ho holistically. So... Yes, we have momentary muscular failure. Yeah, we have what we may think is a subjective zero RIR, which, which I think there is a difference. But then we also have technical failure, which also tends to creep in to our training sessions on the gym floor. And we have to account, that, account for that, especially as 
coaches or individuals who just train ourselves sometimes our competence competency with an exercise uh starts to affect our ability to get through a full set with out technical deviation and this is why i think with every exercise we perform we have to be willing to apply a range of technical deviation that we're going to allow right because it's for some people it it's it's near impossible to get through a full set on a given exercise without any technical deviation at all and we just can't terminate a set just because the most minor change in in technique now if that change in technique is going to affect the safety of an exercise of course we have to terminate set because we have to uphold safety and that's why that range of technical deviation needs to apply to each individual exercise so for example on bicep curl yeah we may allow for some technical deviation maybe the elbows can come forward slightly on a barbell squat though we have to be a little bit more strategic about that technical deviation because if, if we break our technique that may lead to some injury risk i don't know that's just an example and hopefully it makes sense how in practice we have to look out for technical failure and when we're working with individuals who are intermediate to advanced and who want to maximize muscle hypertrophy we should be looking to prescribe exercises that we know these clients can perform with good technique throughout a whole set all the way to momentary muscular failure and that way technical failure or technical deviation isn't as much of an issue but of course when you're working with beginners uh the competency of a beginner with a given exercise is rarely going to map on to the complexity of the exercise and so it's very common that they're going to reach technical failure and that's fine you have to accept that and some of those beginner individuals probably don't need to reach momentary muscular failure anyway or at least that should be reserved until they can get through a full set with good technique Man, those are a lot of interesting points. I I don't want to get too ahead of myself because I actually wanted to ask you about. Well, it's not the same like you mentioned. It's not the same uh, a bicep curl than a squat deadlift. Mm -hmm. What fails in a deadlift, right? What fails in a in a in squat? I, but I, like I said, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. I'd like to move on to your to your recent That's meta analysis. Fun. The main findings, the relationship between velocity loss, that, which I think is really interesting on itself. It's a way of measuring intensity, velocity loss but a little mm -hmm. expensive for most of us and then i think the the most interesting thing that i personally found in your meta analysis was that there is not a linear relationship between proximity to failure and hypertrophy and the way you graphed it I, i think it's it's really really interesting and gives me a lot of insight to my own training and of my clients so anyway i don't want to okay. talk too much i want to give you the microphone can you talk, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about your your recent meta your findings and things that we can apply to our training For sure. So, like you mentioned, Daniel, the main finding I think was that based on the available li literature, it seems like there is a nonlinear relationship between proximity to failure and muscle hypertrophy, whereby sets have to be performed close enough to failure to stimulate meaningful hypertrophy, but beyond a certain point, going closer to failure isn't always better. And it's important to pay attention to the wording there. So training to failure can be better at times, but it may not always be better. And in the current available research that we have, based on the study designs that we have, it seems that when we get closer to failure, that hypertrophy response starts to plateau slightly. So we see this across not just studies that are comparing failure training versus non-failure training, but like you said, Daniel, there is also a, a set of studies that employ a velocity-based method of set termination. So researchers might say, for example, we want this group of participants to terminate their sets when they reached a 40% velocity loss. And we all know intuitively that when we perform repetitions throughout a set, the lifting velocity of each repetition drops off, right, involuntarily. And so if we're experiencing a 40% drop in velocity from the first rep, that's going to lead us very close to momentary muscular failure. And at times, it's actually going to take us to that point. So, Daniel, if we have a group of participants performing resistance training to a 40% velocity loss, we can say that they're likely 
pushing closer to failure than another group of participants who are only training to a 20% velocity loss. And in these studies, we, we seem to see the same, the same response, right? A very low velocity loss, like 10%, doesn't lead to meaningful hypertrophy. Uh, and as we get closer to failure or as velocity loss increases, yes, we see more hypertrophy, but again, it doesn't seem to be, be a linear response. So I think if we zoom out and think about these results practically, uh, I think an important question to try and answer is, well, what does proximity to failure actually tell us? And I think that it allows us to approximate the stimulus achieved within a given set relative to the maximum stimulus that we could possibly achieve within that set. So what I mean by this is that the maximum possible stimulus that can be achieved within a set is likely not the same across all sets within a resistance training session, right? particularly for sets involving the same muscle group. So I like to use this thought experiment to inform some of my programming, right? So imagine performing 10 sets in a row on a barbell bench press, for example, maybe four minutes in between each set and to a one RIR. Let's just imagine that. Now, the stimulus achieved in the first set would arguably be different to the stimulus achieved in the last set, even though they are both performed to a one RIR, right? The first set would probably allow for a greater stimulus because there is less fatigue present. And as fatigue accumulates, the maximum possible stimulus achieved within each of these given sets likely drops off, right? Because the force production that our type two muscle fibers are able to generate is decreasing as fatigue is accumulating. So let's now think about performing all of these sets to failure. If we were to perform all these 10 sets to failure, well, this effect that I'm describing would likely be exacerbated. And if we maybe performed all these sets to a three RIR, the effect would be attenuated, right? So with a three RIR, the stimulus achieved across all sets may be more similar because there's less fatigue. Now, is this a good thing? Maybe, maybe not. And I think it would likely be a good idea to modulate the RIR achieved across all 10 sets because there is no reason that you need to stick to the same RIR on every set that you perform in the gym. There's no reason you need to train to failure on every set that you perform as well. So you could, for example, decrease the RIR achieved across the sets as you get closer to the end of the workout when fatigue has less of an effect on you know your subsequent sets or less of a negative effect on subsequent sets to the point where you may actually reach failure on you know the last couple sets of that 10 set workout so that's the way i like to think about it and this understanding allows me to design a productive training session for my clients that's based on the context of the session as a whole and this is why it's so important we consider the interaction between all of these variables, right? If we were to change the exercise from a barbell bench press to a barbell squat or to a leg extension, right, the RIR recommenda recommendations would change because each of these exercises comes with its own features and demands. Some exercises are more fatiguing than others. And if we change the rest period in between sets, the RIR recommendations would also change. If we were able to now rest 10 minutes in between each set, well, you could probably get away with pushing closer to failure because there's more recovery time. If you're only resting one minute, well, you also have to account for that. So I think the, the cornerstone takeaway from my meta-analysis was, was that there is, that there is this potential non-linear relationship between proximity failure and muscle hypertrophy, but that needs to be considered within the context of a whole workout. And there's simply no reason why you have to either train to failure or not to failure. And really when we consider all these factors that I'm describing and we consider how the maximum possible stimulus we can achieve within a given set likely changes across a workout as fatigue accumulates, well, we should actually be, we should likely be implementing various proximities to failure, including failure in our training to take advantage of the context of the session we're performing, right? If we're only performing two sets for a given muscle group in a given workout, we can probably push those two sets to failure because the the effect of fatigue is is low, right? If you've got two bicep curl sets that you need to perform in a, in a, in a session, you could get away with pushing them to failure. And 
that's going to likely give you a great response. Now, on the other hand, if you had two sets of barbell squats, would you push them to failure? Maybe not, because there's safety concerns and there's also fatigue concerns that may end up affecting the rest of your session. Because as we know, two sets of barbell squats to failure is, li is likely enough to wipe you out, whereas two sets of a bicep curl isn't. So I really like to stress the importance of zooming out and assessing the results of this research and the, the findings of, of, of research studies within the context of, you know, your session as a whole and the individuals that, that you're working with. And hopefully what I'm getting at there makes sense and goes to, show, goes to show why programming needs to be so adaptive and goes to show why we can't just take the results of a research study and immediately apply them into our client's training program. Uh, essentially what I do when I look at the results of a research study is I filter it through a framework of thinking that I've created to help me understand how research results can be implemented in practice. And that doesn't look as easy as just taking the results of the study and literally applying them into my client's program. There's a whole framework that these results get filtered through before I actually go ahead and write up a program and attempt to apply some of those results. So hopefully that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense, man. And I'm glad you mentioned it because what your mate I say is that maybe there's not a linear relationship between stimuli to failure and hypertrophy. But what it's not saying is that you shouldn't train to failure. That training to failure is per se an inferior let's say, technique or way of doing things, which is not. What if we are only doing maybe two sessions a week for a given muscle group with two, three sets? I don't know why anyone would do that, but let's, let's assume they would. Maybe you should take those to failure. And like you mentioned also, it also depends on the exercise. It's not the same talking about a barbell bench press, a back squat, a deadlift. And, and mm -hmm. this thing gives us a lot of groundwork to adjust to, to the particular needs of the client or, or, or of our own training. And I think mm -hmm. that also comes with another set of, of, of observations, which for instance, like again, I'm piggybacking on the on the, the Schoenfeld study, the Radiali replication. Mm -hmm. What happens when people are doing that many sets? What is actually, what is failing? Is it truly momentary muscle failure or is it something other happening with all that, mm -hmm. all that volume? And I think, at least in Mexico, I can tell you with a great, 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 great um, um, confidence, people drink with a hell of a lot of volume, man. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that volume is particularly effective. It's speaking of proximity to failure. Maybe the perception of fatigue is super high, with, with, with our, with, which should mm -hmm. be doing a ton of sets. But understanding what is the point of leaving some reps in reserve, I think... It's not that we're weak. It's not that we're not trying to train hard. Um, I had a conversation similar to this with, with Dr. Eric Holmes a while back, where he mentioned that mm -hmm. training to failure is, is something like a foolproof, foolproof method of training because if you go, mm -hmm. to failure, well, you're, you're going to get kicked. Right? But it's not, mm -hmm. the, it's not that objective. It's what are you getting besides the stimulation? You're getting a lot of fatigue and then can maybe shorten your mass cycle. And maybe I'm getting a few ahead of myself because a lot of, of things came to mind with all that dimension. So I wanted to move on with that perception of fatigue morning, the relationship between what we are experiencing in training, the perception of discomfort, and what is true proximity to failure. How can one, as a coach and also as a trainee, learn to differentiate between the two? Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's a, that's a question that I address quite often uh, with my clients. And I think that confusing per perceived discomfort with proximity to failure can really be a bottleneck in one's training journey. And what you're describing there, Daniel, with people in Mexico training with a, a high degree of volume and, and likely not getting the most out of each set they're performing, one of the reasons that they may be performing these sets and that they may be under the impression they are doing good enough to get the response they want is that they're experiencing perceived discomfort and they're confusing that with training hard enough. So we, we promote hard training a lot 
we all know that hard training is necessary to build muscle. We all know that training needs to get harder over time. There's no doubting that. There's no refuting that. But what does hard actually mean? So this is another conversation that I have with a lot of my clients. You know, colloquially, the definition of hard is just applying a greater deal of effort. But on the gym floor, we can apply a greater deal of effort in many different ways. And sometimes people think that the perceived discomfort they feel in training means that they're working hard and means that they're stimulating muscle hypertrophy or at least meaningful muscle hypertrophy from the sets they're performing when in fact the opposite may be true. So what I mean by this is you could be feeling a high perceived discomfort within a set but still be five plus repetitions away from momentary muscular failure. And if you're terminating your set when perceived discomfort gets to a certain point because you think that that's a hard set, you're likely leaving gains on the table. And this tends to happen quite a lot on the gym floor, at least I seem to observe it a lot on the gym floor, particularly with beginners who I haven't had this conversation with. And, you know, I think it's it's a fair kind of, conf- it, it's, it's fair for a beginner to think that they're training hard if they're feeling discomfort. But when you have this conversation and when you dig a bit deeper and you realize that perceived discomfort itself doesn't necessarily have an association with the physiological adaptations we experience from resistance training, like it's simply just a short-term response that we feel upon contracting our muscles. When you understand that and when you start to realize that perceived discomfort can be high, even if you're very far from failure, your your training will almost suddenly become so much more productive because you simply understand that concept. So I think that the first step to answering your question, Daniel, is simply having that conversation with the client, with an individual, and and making that and, and, and establishing that difference between what is perceived discomfort and what is proximity to failure and then actually getting an individual to experience momentary muscular failure so that they know what that truly feels like, right? So it's very common, Daniel, to hear people say that individuals aren't very good at, perform- at predicting their RIR. People don't know how to predict RIR. People are horrible. And I think that claim lacks specificity. So if we're speaking about people who've never trained before, then I agree. Like if, if, we, if we have a group of untrained participants come into the lab and we get them to predict their RIR, it's going to be off, like no doubt about that. And we see that in research studies which show that people mispredict their RIR quite commonly. But these people are untrained individuals or very – um, much uh, early in the early stages of their training career. So they're beginners. Now, over time, though, if we were to grab those same, that same group of people and we were to put them through the same study day after day, week after week, and we spoke to them about these concepts, undoubtedly, undoubtedly their RIR predictions would improve, right? So we have to understand that the results of these research studies are conducted in isolation, but on the gym floor, when I'm working with a beginner client, for example, I don't really care if their RIR predictions are off when they're beginners because I don't even use RIR with a beginner. But I'm having these conversations with them and I'm teaching them how to train to failure. I'm teaching them what discomfort feels like. And over time, their RIR predictions improve and we can get to the point where we are in in the intermediate and advanced stages of our career, of our training career, and we understand what discomfort feels like. We know what training to failure feels like too. And we can be quite accurate with our RIR predictions. And I have some uh, research that will be published in the coming months that shows in a resistance train sample that has RIR experience. When I say resistance trained, I mean seven to eight years of training experience, uh, plus quite a high relative strength level. Um, In this sample of participants who have had RIR experience, their RIR predictions can be quite accurate. within like less than a rep from the RIR target. And so I think that's quite promising. And that goes to show that if you have these conversations with individuals and if you do push them to failure at times 
And if you do teach them what discomfort feels like, well, they can get to the point where they have an accurate enough perception of proximity to failure to implement like an RIR prescription in their training. And I think that's why we can't just say, I think you mentioned earlier, you said we can't just say that training to failure is unnecessary right. because you never know what a true 2RIR or a true 1RIR feels like if you've never actually reached that point of momentary muscular failure. And that's exercise specific, right? So you do have to, I guess, inject some failure training into your client's programs strategically so that they know what it feels like. That might look like failure on the last set of an exercise. That might look like hitting failure in the last week of a program. It can look uh, like many different methods. Uh, but as long as you do that, you know, intermittently throughout a program, uh, I, think, I think you're going to be on the right track with getting your clients or getting individuals closer to where they need to be so that like an RIR prescription is a reliable method that you can implement in a training program. That's pretty interesting, man. Is that going to be an RCT, the, the study you mentioned that you're conducting, that you're conducting? Yeah, so that is, so I also have another study uh, that will be published uh, looking at the influence of proximity to failure on fatigue. And before I conducted that RCT, so that was a randomized control trial, right. I put participants through a familiarization period where I got them to predict their RIR and I assess their RIR accuracy. Uh, and essentially that that first week, that familiarization week from the RCT is going to make up its own study that will be published, uh, which is simply based on, on RIR accuracy. Oh man, I'll be on the lookout for that one. Sounds pretty yeah. interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Gives a lot of a lot of light in the, in the topic. That's one of the things that I also wanted to to to, question, to ask you that you already alluded to. The difference between beginner trainees, intermediate trainees, and also mm, advanced people. For instance, in beginners, there's research, as far as my knowledge goes, that even when they select their loads they're going to train with, it's going to be effective because they're beginning. If they get off the couch, they're going to get hypertrophy. If they get to walk a little bit, they're going to get the training, right? But when is the cutoff when we need to implement some tools, maybe not um, repetitions in reserve, but maybe some, some something to gauge perception, perception of discomfort. What tools do you, do, do you usually use with beginners before before going or jumping into repetitions in your stuff working? Yeah, that, that's another good question. So, so with beginners, the, the first point of call for me is to address their technique. Yes. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, generally when you're working with a beginner, their level of competency with a given exercise isn't going to map on to its complexity unless it's like a bicep curl or a leg extension, a single joint exercise that is quite closed um, in nature. But when we're, when we're looking at exercises like a bench press or a squat leg press, uh, technique does need to be the, the, the main focus point of a beginner's exercise or coaching journey, uh, especially if we're speaking about this from like a, a coaching perspective. So, so that's, that's the first focus point. And like you said, Daniel, a beginner is going to achieve hypertrophy and is going to develop their strength training <laughs> far from failure, training to failure, doing many different things. But of course, some, some methods can be better than others. So with a beginner, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm teaching them te technique. I'm teaching them the importance of upholding that technique throughout a whole set and I take a similar approach to the one I described earlier where I, I do involve some failure training in their program just to, to teach them what it feels like. Um, and it, it's quite like as a face-to-face -face coach, it, it's a lot easier than, than being an online coach because with, with online coaching, if you're working with a beginner, it's very ambiguous as to what they're doing on their own when you're not there. But with a, as a face-to-face -face coach, I can, I can watch an individual train and, and I can see, see how hard they're pushing and I can ask them questions and I can investigate and, and you know, ask them how hard they, they feel that set subjectively was. And I just use a whole bunch of different cues to, to guide the intensity of training within the first few weeks. 
Plus, I have all these conversations with the client, like I like I discussed earlier, and I, I think the I think the the conversation aspect is is critical. I think just simply sitting down with a client and like putting them through a leg extension set. So this is a good test. I, I put a client through a leg extension, a beginner, and it'll be a high rep set. And I'll notice that they'll want to stop their set because it hurts so much, but the speed of the reps isn't slowing down. And then what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just tell them to stop the set. I'll be like, hey, why did you terminate that set? What led you to terminating that set? And they'll be like, oh, it burns so much. And that's, the, that's what will instigate a conversation that can be so crucial in the long run because then I can say, well, the speed of your reps wasn't slowing down. This is something that you as a client need to pay attention to when you're training on your own, the velocity of the reps. And we're now going to perform another set and you're not actually going to stop until the velocity of the rep starts to slow down. And as soon as you do that and a, a client in real time is experiencing the difference between terminating the set because it burns and because of the discomfort and terminating the set because the lifting velocity is slowing down, like that in itself is so powerful and can go a long way. And this is this is an approach I like to take in, in, the, in the starting, like in the, the first few weeks of of working with a, a new client, no matter if they're a beginner or maybe an early intermediate, um, you know, an early intermediate may also be at a stage in their training career where they're, they're pushing hard, but on some exercises they're, they're, they're terminating their sets a bit too early and leaving games on the table. Um, some exercises are more notorious for this, for this observation than others. So a leg extension, like, burns comes with a high perceived discomfort and so does a leg press for example lower body exercises generally uh and so some of these exercises need to be you need as a coach you need to pay a bit more attention to those exercises and there's no specific tools that like i use uh in isolation but rather i use a, a whole variety of tools and i use conversation to try and guide my client to you know where i want them to be so so hopefully that that answers your question yeah and this this particular topic always blows my mind because for instance in beginners let's let's take again the, the leg extension as an example yeah let's, let's say we have a beginner and we prescribed i don't know 15 reps and maybe in a beginner if we say 15 reps maybe one or two repetitions in reserve as a beginner Maybe they, they will cut this, themselves short because if you see a video of them performing that exercise, maybe the last reps are actually faster than the, than the ones before. So for them, because it hurts, it burns. Of course it burns. Mm -hmm. Maybe for them, that was one or two repetitions in reserve. It's almost paradoxical that applying repetitions in reserve led to worse results, to a, to a, to a less productive training, which would, wouldn't be the case. You know, person that's that has a little bit more experience and that's the next question I wanted to ask with the research that we have and your experience on your own research how accurate do we need to be with RAR now that we understand that it, it's not just discomfort it's actually true momentary muscle failures are we talking about as a, as a as, as reaching failure is it really a difference if we go one repetition, two repetitions, and as far as also as I know, I, I think it's maybe the the most repetitions in reserve we can leave in the table are something around four to five and still see the same magnitude of gains. But anyway, how accurate do we need to be when applying this tool in a intermediate or advanced lifter that knows all these things that we, we've been talking before? Yeah. So, so very loaded question. We can we can take take the answer to this question. I, was just, I feel I feel like there were three three different questions there. But yeah, right. I, I'm not sure if I I'm not sure if I agree with the last part of your question where you mentioned you know four to five reps in reserve. That's yeah, that's yeah, a cutoff yeah. point. I, I'm not sure if I agree with that because if we look at the 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 research studies that we currently have, not only is there limitations to how failure is controlled in some studies. Now, look, I'm, I'm trying my best to control for that by categorizing studies into different themes. So let's say we've controlled for that because participants are trained to momentary muscular failure when prescribed to do so. But in the non-failure groups, some researchers don't pay as much respect to proximity to failure as they probably should. And so when we look at the set and rep prescriptions, 
uh, in these non-family groups, it's hard to elucidate the true RIR that the participants are reaching. So, for example, Daniel, if, again, if I had a group of 10 people and I told them all to do three sets of 10 with 70% of their one rep max, they would all go ahead and do that, but the RIR that they would all achieve may be different. We can't actually be 100% sure that three sets of 10 with 70% of one rep max is going to lead to the same RIR across participants. So with from my interpretation of the literature, I don't really know what that threshold point is. I don't know what the minimum RIR we have to reach is to promote you know, meaningful muscle hypertrophy. Maybe it's around that four to five mark, maybe it's six, maybe it's three, maybe it's two. Uh, my future research will hopefully clarify that a bit further, but I hope that makes sense. Um, and and I hope that makes it clear why it's, it's so hard for me to prescribe specific RIR recommendations. And rather I try and zoom out and teach people how they should consider proximity to failure um, in the context of, their application of the other training variables. Now, when it comes to the other question you asked, you mentioned uh, how accurate does someone need to be with their RIR predictions for it to be reliable. That's, that's also tricky, but I don't think you have to be predicting your RIR perfectly for it to be a, a reliable tool to use uh, with yourself or with your clients. In the meta-analysis, what I recommended in the practical application section was that all sets, all your sets, if you're looking to build muscle, should be pushed with a close proximity to failure, right? So you should be pushing all your sets close to failure. Maybe that's a three RIR and under, right? Most of them. Uh, and when I'm working with clients, I don't often program like a four or a five RIR because the, the higher the RIR value, the greater the chances of clients mispredicting their RIR. So I err on the side of caution and prescribe lower RIR values. And I also try and give my clients the best opportunity possible to predict RIR accurately. So this comes back to something you alluded to earlier. If we had a beginner and we told them to do 20 reps on a leg extension and predict their RIR, it's almost impossible for them to be perfect because of the perceived discomfort they experience. This might even apply to an intermediate and potentially an advanced individual as well. So what I'm saying here is that people are able to predict their RIR more accurately with a heavier load versus a lighter load for, I think, two main reasons. With a heavier load, you start your sets closer to failure by default, and you also experience less perceived discomfort than a higher repetition set generally, right? A higher repetition set that is more sustained uh, and that is clearly more prolonged will likely come with more perceived discomfort and make it harder for people to predict accurately. So in my training, in my programming for clients, especially like in some beginner to intermediate clients, you'll rarely see high rep ranges being prescribed because I'm trying to make it easy for my clients to be accurate with their RIR predictions if I'm using RIR prescription as a method of set termination. Even if I wasn't using RIR prescription as a method of set termination, I think everything I said still stands its ground because if we have a client who isn't using RIR prescription and we tell them to lift a heavy load versus lifting a light load, then the, with a the heavy load, I have more confidence in them being closer to failure upon completing their set versus a lighter load because for all the reasons we've already discussed the chances of pre premature set termination are higher with a lighter load and with higher reps so this is a good example of why we can't just take results from research studies and apply them immediately in practice so uh, i've also published a meta-analysis that shows muscle hypertrophy seems to be equivalent between high load and low load training right and some people may take the results of that study and be like, okay, well, it doesn't matter if we prescribe 20 reps, doesn't matter if we prescribe five reps, 30 reps, the hypertrophy is going to be the same. But in practice, it simply doesn't play out like that uh, because of all the things that we've already spoken about. So if I have a client who I know understands the difference between perceived discomfort and proximity to failure, 
and is advanced and I trust in their abilities to push hard, I'll be more inclined to prescribe higher rep ranges for them versus a beginner to intermediate client who's still learning their way through the process. I'd be more confident prescribing like an 8 to 12 rep range because the chance of them actually terminating their sets close to failure and predicting RIR accurately if I am using an RIR prescription approach is going to be higher. So I'm not sure if I answered your questions. I think I answered some of them. I think yeah. maybe there are still some remaining that I haven't touched on, but I can't remember them. And, and hopefully that at least gives people some insight into how I program. And that doesn't necessarily mean you should be programming like that. I just think you should kind of take on the thought process that I'm employing here where I'm not just extracting results from studies and injecting them straight into my client's training program. I'm trying to filter them through that, that framework of thinking that allows me to, to guide my programming decisions as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to telling me exactly what to do. So like research results for me, they guide my decision-making, but they don't tell me exactly what to do. So hopefully that makes sense. It does make a lot of sense, and you did answer, so so thanks. I know my questions tend to be sometimes a little bit <laughs> mushy, so so sorry for that in advance, Martin. And one last, okay. one last thing I wanted to ask you, I don't want to take any more of your time. Um, do you think, based on your own interpretation and reading of the literature, do you think, you already alluded to it, but, but do you think when we apply, when we apply, I'm sorry, light loads, do we need to always go closer and closer to failure or maybe when we know how to differ differentiate the, the discomfort the pain the, the burning from from the true proximity to failure we can actually use maybe more repetitions in reserve with light loads or just as a just to be safe let's 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 apply more closer proximities to failure with light loads i don't know if that makes yeah sense. i I, I think that's more of a practical question. And I think, I think with, if you are employing light or low training with high repetitions, you should err on the side of caution because of the PC discomfort and all the things we've already discussed okay. and prescribe a low RIR or tell, tell uh, clients to train closer to failure than they would if they were um, lifting a high load, just to err on the side of caution. There have been two studies, one by Les Evicus et al. and one by No Breaker, that have looked at the, the effects of proximity to failure on like loading conditions. One study found that you do have to push closer to failure, or it seems like you have to push closer to failure if you're lifting a low load versus a, a heavy load or high load. The other study didn't seem to, to find much of a difference. So we simply need more research on this topic to be more confident about our claims surrounding it But like I said, I think in practice, um, we should err on the side of caution when we're employing light, lighter loads uh, because of what we've already discussed. But really, the, the fundamental ideas um, that I'm discussing here, they can be applied no matter the, the load that we lift. So if we think about it this way, um, and this tends to make sense for a lot of people, if you're lifting a low load, you simply have less magnitude of force and tension being applied per repetition. So you simply have to do more repetitions to expose your muscle fibers to enough force and enough mechanical tension across a set. If you're lifting a heavier load, you have more force, more, more tension per repetition, and you simply do less reps to expose your muscle fibers to enough of that tension. So the, fundament, the fundamental idea stays the same across the loading conditions. It's just that in practice, people are more likely to prematurely terminate their sets when they're lifting a lighter load because of perceived discomfort. So like I said, you could err on the side of caution and make sure that you're telling people, telling clients who are lifting a lighter load for higher repetitions to push closer to failure than they otherwise would if they were lifting a higher load. And if you're prescribing an RIR to inform set termination, well, the lighter load training may be prescribed to a lower RIR versus the higher load training. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. And again, a lot of sense, man. To me, it's yeah. been <laughs> really interesting because it's it's not the same to read a paper to to discuss the paper than to actually talk with the person behind the paper. So to me, it's a really big honor, man. And also, the last thing before before finish, finishing this up, I want to ask you for some key takeaways 
that you have gathered from your own research, from your interpretation, and also your experience with your clients now that you've done this? Sorry, Daniel, I missed some of that. I think you cut out for a bit. Could you, no, could you don't please? Yeah. I want to ask you some key takeaways that you particularly learned from conducting this research, from working with your clients now that you've done this research. How, how have you, your own interpretation, your own, let's say, way of doing things in regards to personal okay. failure? Okay. okay, so I think, I think the main takeaway, and I've mentioned this a few times, is that when we read the results of a research study, and this has become, for me, this has become more important over time as I have immersed myself into more and more research. When we read those results, we simply can't apply them to our training directly. So I mentioned try, the importance of trying to build a framework of thinking to help guide your decision-making. And I think how this starts is by having a, a solid understanding of of how things work. So that's the foundation of pretty much everything we discuss, right? So physiology, how do things within the, the body actually work? Sure. That provides the basis for our understanding of principles, right? So if you're not using principles to guide your decision-making with your programming, then I think the chances of you being led astray with your programming are going to be quite high. And the chances of you being confused when it comes to sitting down and actually writing a program is also going to be quite high. And I see this a lot with people who are starting to get into evidence-based fitness and especially coaches who are stepping foot into the industry who, who simply don't have that understanding of principles and they don't have the foundational knowledge of how things work. They're confused upon trying to write a training program. So, this all needs to be established before you even read the results of research. I think research comes into play because it allows us to fine tune our understanding of the variables. So like what we have to do on the gym floor to write a training program and to elicit a result, right? So we have physiology, how do things work? We have principles that tells us, well, why, right? So physiology would tell us how does muscle grow? Principles would tell us why. Well, progressive overload is, is one of those principles. And then the variables that we actually sit down and implement in a program, like the volume, the proximity to failure, the load, all the things we spoke about today, that tells us what we have to do to, to uphold our understanding of the principles, right? And research helps us fine-tune our understanding of volume, proximity to failure, load. But like I said... There, there is a gap between research and practice and we then have to take those research results, um, un try and fine-tune our understanding of the variables and then look at our individual clients and, and look at the context of the program that we're trying to, to develop here and to design and use all of that knowledge to create a program that is based on, on science, right? So it's based on our understanding of research and physiology and principles. And it's also, it's also based on our experiences, coaches, and on our clients, right, and their preferences and their ability to adhere and to sustain, sustain a program. So that, to me, that framework of thinking has only become more and more important as I have immersed myself in, in more research. And that that is such a crucial part of being a, an evidence-based coach that I think people try and bypass. People bypass all of those steps, or at least some people do from what I've observed, and, and they read research and like, okay, this is what I have to do because this is what the conclusion of the study says. But I've mentioned this many times before, and I'll mention it again because it's so important. Researchers don't design research questions to inform how each and every one of us should be approaching our own training. They design research questions to tease out cause and effect, to isolate variables, and to, to disprove certain hypotheses. And we simply have to appreciate and acknowledge that when we're trying to interpret research. And having that framework of thinking as a coach is, is simply more important than being able to read a study and look at the conclusion and then try and take that conclusion and apply it into our client's training program. So I think that's, that's a key takeaway that isn't too relevant to like the meta-analysis that this discussion was meant to be based upon, but I think it's, it's relevant to like everything we do as a coach, yeah. or at least 
things that are relevant to programming related decisions, which proximity to failure is obviously playing, playing a role within. So if there's one thing that listeners can take away, it's the importance of understanding how, understanding why, understanding what we have to do on the gym floor. And then remembering that research is just guiding our understanding of, you know, what we have to do. And that is what will help you bridge the gap between research and practice. That was way a lot of more bang for my buck, man. That's a really interesting takeaway because I've been guilty of that. There's a new study that says this. Mostly in the volume wars, I think you recall that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. When people begin to do more volume, more volume, because the study said so, and, you know, and, and the way that you clarify that studies are not designed to tell you what to do. They're designed to isolate variables and so on. I think it's really important to have in mind. So, Martin, we did cover a lot of ground. I just want to, to thank you again. You're more than welcome in Mexico. It would be, it would be so much cool to have this, 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 this conversation here in Mexico to have, to have you speaking in, in an event. So you're more than welcome. And I want to thank you again for your time, man. It's truly an honor, truly a privilege. And I think that covers pretty much it, man. No worries, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me on. And I'd be more than happy to, to come down to Mexico with the JPS crew. So uh, oh, maybe sure. we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to set something up one day. Hopefully, hopefully. So I hope you have a great rest of the day, man, and more than welcome. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. See ya.